Welcome to Around the Valley. This is Sean Tellis. Today is October 9, 2012. We have three great guests with us today, along with our co-hosts Art Landing and Lucia Flores from Rosemead Kiwanis and Ballin Park Education, respectively. Uh, we have Joe Liao, President, Founder of the Vet Hunters Project. We have Executive Director Melanie Villarreal, the co-founder from uh, the Vet Hunters Project. And we have musician, scholar, and educator Martin Espino. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming. Thanks for Thank you. Thank yeah, you. so where should we start this conversation? Uh, should we start with the stand-down? Do we have a stand down going down or we do we do um first of all thanks for having us here <clears throat> yeah we, we have a this is our second annual stand down event and for those that are listening that don't know what a stand down is is uh it's a one to three day event and in this case for us it's a three day event where we're gonna prevent as much homelessness and the way we do that is we we're incorporating a job fair within the stand down and we're also going to do placements um we're going to get as many service, well, we're already in the process of getting many service providers that we're letting them know uh, that when they come there to the stand down event, it's not an event where they're just going to come and sit down and pass out pieces of paper. We want these guys to get, you know, to put in some work. Uh, this is an opportunity for us to capture as many homeless veterans or veterans in jeopardy of becoming homeless all in one area for three days so that it gives us three solid days to attack these issues head on. Before you keep going, can I ask you, when is this going to happen? When is the date? This is uh, taking place November 2nd through the 4th, uh, right across the street from the Army Reserve Center uh, in South Del Monte, right there on Potrero. Uh, is that next to the uh, the farm, the organic farm? Right next to it. Um, uh, outstanding. Right next to it. We're going to have it there. And we're, very, we're blessed to have the U.S. Army that's going to be providing... Uh, tents. They're going to be providing the cots, the laundry support, the shower support, and uh, having the military uh, join us because that's, I'm also with the U.S. Army. Yeah, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that. Are you a military man? Uh, you know, yeah, I was. Uh, I, I served in the military. I'm now with the uh, Army Reserve, and, and I do a lot of stuff at the civilian level for them. Whether it's going out to the community and capturing as many resources to bring them back to the service member and families. Uh, what I've what I've learned is a lot of our currently serving uh, service members are they're in trouble. I mean these guys they're doing multiple tours. Some of these guys are volunteering to go back to serve again because the economy is bad, the jobs, and then they're coming back disabled vets. They're coming back injured. They're coming back with PTSD. They're coming back to no jobs. And and the biggest the biggest frustration that we have is that they're taking their lives. Some of these guys we've lost more to suicide. Uh, than we've had in the Afghanistan fatalities uh, in combat. So, so it's no long, it's an epidemic. It's an epidemic now. It's not an accident. It's uh, it's happening. So, this is the reason why we're putting this event together. Uh, we are an organization that was founded, and and uh, you know, red tape is no red tape is how we operate. That that's the way we put it. Uh, we're not government funded. And that organization is the Vet Hunters. Vet Hunters Project. Uh, we post everything that we do on Facebook. Um, so that we show people how it is that we're placing and preventing homelessness for veterans. Since we've started, our one-year anniversary, official anniversary is going to, this month. Oh, congratulations. Well, yeah, it's, it's great. And within that time, we've placed, we're now almost at 1,300. And, and, and if you think about it, earlier I was asked this question about what are others doing? I wish we didn't have to exist. I really did. I, I, I really wish that Vet Hunters was just uh, it was a, a dream. Uh, that they didn't have. But the reality is, is that it, it does have to exist because those guys are out there. For example, we have Veterans Day coming up, right? And um, you will see people take the stage and they will thank the veterans. Thank you for your service. But they're forgetting the invisible heroes. They're forgetting the homeless veterans that they too made Veterans Day possible. But a lot of times people forget. People want to help, but they don't know how. Sometimes they look at, I used to be that guy. Uh, even though I'm a combat veteran, I, I served with the 101st, I, I, I did, you know, I was in Iraq. I used to be the guy, and I'm ashamed to say this, but I fixed it in here through action, is that I used to pull off the freeway, for example, and I used to see a vet with a sign that said served in Nam from 67 to 69, for example. And um, I, I would look the other way. I would 
change the radio station. Not that I had to. It's just I was afraid to see him. The reason I was afraid to see him is because I didn't know how to help him. I would roll my window down, give him a couple bucks, and I would say, I, I hope that he uses it. You know where. So I rep my my actions represent a lot of people today. It's not that they don't want to help. It's just they're like, well, wait a minute. If I roll the window down and I ask him a question, and he needs help, what do I do? And now I'm obligated, and I don't know how to help. Yeah, I'm glad you said that. So let's take it back to the stand down. Sure. Can you walk us through kind of uh, sure. what that does? So the stand down is is. Um, oh, I'm sorry. And can you tell us what a stand down is? Yeah, stand down is is um, where homeless veterans can go find peace and get off the streets and in, in war a stand down was where they would come back into the camps and you know be able to relax and you know just get away from the effects of combat same mm -hmm. thing for this type of stand down mm -hmm. you know uh, we like to think that vet hunters are deployed in america and our combat is the streets the very same street that these homeless veterans are dying in mm -hmm. they served and they're dying out there so therefore the term stand down that was originally founded in san diego uh, those guys have done an outstanding job. The, the term stand down is what we're going to have so that we can bring them off the streets. And you, we'll give them food and, and love is one thing, but the respect and the resources and to actually walk them by the numbers and to say that these are your resources. And a lot of them are going to look at us and say, I never knew that the VA was different or I never knew that all this so we're we're inviting everybody. You know, we're invite, if you're a service provider, and you're a doctor or you're an optometrist, and you want to give back, this is an opportunity for you to give back. Um, when it's a homeless veteran issue, it's an American issue. We've been at war for over 200 years collectively. If you look at our history, uh, yet we have homeless veterans. Homeless veterans are the sons and daughters of America. Uh, when you say I support the troops, it's all who served, everyone who served. Um, and we put these events together, and we start off with no budget. It's kind of funny. We don't wait for a budget. We're not the type of organization that if we don't have a dollar in our bank account, we're going to say, well, guys, we can't go out there because we don't have funding. We work harder because it, does, it costs zero dollars for effort to make one phone call or to help somebody out. So we started with no, no, no budget to put this together. And we called upon the village. You know that whole, it takes a village to pull this stuff off? Mm -hmm. We called upon American Legion. We called upon county supervisors. We called upon Grace Napolitano. And we need help. And all these pieces started to fit <coughs> together. But that's the way it should be. A stand down should be collective. The community coming together to bring all these resources to help those that have helped us. Yeah. So... I think that's great. I think you couldn't put it better than that, right? Um, Melanie, did you want to add anything? Yeah, no, just the, you know, the stand down, it's, uh, it's, it's really a great thing that, um, that we do. Like Joe mentioned, this is the second year that it's going to be happening. Um, and what, uh, what I think is just most impressive about what's going to be happening this year is just the level of involvement that the U.S. Army um, Reserve has gotten into. Um, just bringing in, you know, the tents and the showers and the cots and the, la the laundry facilities, all of that stuff, to really be able to set up this full three-day camp. It's going to be a complete military camp. Um, so when you get into other issues like, you know, PTSD or flashbacks or anything like that that a lot of these veterans are dealing with out alone on the streets, um, now all of a sudden here is going to be kind of familiar territory that they get to walk back into. They'll be welcomed by their brethren. Um, we're working really hard to get the word out to, you know, Patriot Guard and, like Joe said, the legions, the VFWs. Um, so when when the veterans arrive, they'll be, you know, arriving by bus, by, you know, every different manner that we can get them there. Um, they're they're going to be welcomed, but it's, uh, you know, a lot of what we, we do is we always thanks um, veterans for their service and we welcome them home um, and you know Joe keeps saying this is going to be a true welcome home for them and I think that's what's so powerful about it is we get to say welcome home not just for three days but here's all these people in front of you that are here to end your homelessness or prevent it if you're just experiencing a hardship um, so we have a really really great connection through the Vet Hunters Project to be able to get the word out directly to currently serving um, army reservists and guardsmen reservists from other military branches as well so um, we're tapping into a network of people in need that you just you're, you're not going to see that anywhere else. So it's going to be a really tremendous event. So if someone wants to get in contact with you guys, either to volunteer their services or to take part, how do they do that? Um, they can call us directly um, or uh, they can email us. It would be just info at vethunters.org. 
Um, visit our website is www.vethunters.org. Um, follow our Facebook or Facebook forward slash the Vet Hunters Project. Um, if you just type in the Vet Hunters Project in Google, you'll very easily find us. And uh, we post everything. We're very, very social media savvy to let everybody know what we have going on every day. Um, so if you do that through Google, you'll definitely not be lost for updates. That's great. So we're going to take a break and we'll come back and we'll ask you some questions. And uh, we'll keep going from there. San Gabriel Valley Events, brought to you by Mid-Valley News. In the city of Baldwin Park, there will be a CPR training session November 17th from 8.30 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. You can get uh, your certificate for standard first aid, CPR, and AED. For more information, check the Baldwin Park website at www.baldwinpark.com. Baldwin Park will be having their hazardous waste and e-waste event at Morgan, the parking lot of Morgan Park, Saturday, October 20th, from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. For more information, check out the Baldwin Park website at www.baldwinpark.com. Coming home can be hard if you're a veteran of Iraq or Afghanistan. You may feel like you're all alone, but you're not alone. At IAVA.org, your fellow vets are all around you. Join our free online community, get the resources you need, and connect to other vets who know where you're coming from. IAVA.org. We've got your back. Welcome back to Around the Valley. We're here with our special guest, Joe Liel, president and founder of the Vet Hunters Project, Melanie Villarreal, executive director and co-founder of the Vet Hunters, Hunters Project, and Martin Espino, musician, educator, and scholar. Welcome back, everybody. Thanks for that first uh <laughs> segment um you guys really are providing a lot of uh, different um things to a lot of different people uh and at the same time it's really specific so it's kind of a nice combination uh we'll let our guest uh martin start off with a question do you have a question for these guys yeah i'm just um where are you gonna get the veterans from because i mean if they're homeless then how do you locate them i mean it could be somebody out in the river and you're gonna go and ask him he's a vet gonna say uh, uh yeah sure yeah I mean, you know uh, how do you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, that's that's actually I'm just what curious. we yeah well, that's that's reason. what we that's do on a daily basis yeah, yeah that's that's why we're called vet hunters because we actually go out and look for them so um, we don't we believe that you know you don't wait for the veterans to seek out the services you take the services to the veterans it should have been happening for a very very long time now um, we've been doing it for over a year and it and it works so um, we do go into the washes and the canyons we hike the trails we find oh, wow. encampments off the grid we work uh, in San Bernardino there's an encampment completely off the grid 300 people large and we go in there we get to know um, the people who are living there we identify all the residents we pull out the veterans identify all of them and we just go to work and start um, getting to know them on a one-on-one -on -one basis figure out mm -hmm. how they got there what their you know specific situation is and how to plug them into what they need you know it, what helps us out a lot is we, we use our military training about 90 percent of us are are mm -hmm. You know, uh, we have, unfortunately, we have guys, vet hunters that are deployed right now. They just deployed. Uh, so so we're a little short-staffed when it comes to service members because, you know, they're serving their country right now. Mm -hmm. But uh, newspapers helps us out a lot because we've gotten to the point where we're, you talk about rivers. We spend a lot of our time in encampments, canyons, and all sorts of stuff. We've earned the trust uh, of the homeless community. Then normally in every homeless community, you're going to have what we call a mayor, that one particular guy or female, depending on the camp, that you got to pretty much ask permission from him. He controls what goes on in those camps. It exists. Believe me, it does. There are places that large, huh? Yeah, yeah. Wow. So so That's we've awesome. earned we've earned the respect of these guys to where they are now vet hunting. For example... We literally stopped at an area where there's a high concentration of homeless. And here's what we told them. Here's flyers. Spread the word. And boy, did they, they rode bicycles across San Gabriel Valley dropping off flyers. The reason why, we have regular homeless Americans. We call them our brothers and sisters, right? They help us find homeless veterans. So homeless helping to find homeless. Very, very interesting. It took us a long time to gain this, this respect. Mm -hmm. But because we do something very unique, and it sounds ridiculous, but here's what unique means. We'll show up. They'll say, yeah, we know about you guys. You guys are vet hunters. We read about you in the newspaper because 
they read the newspaper all the time. And they're like, well, it's about time you came here because we were wondering when you we were going to find us. So we go there. And the relationship, the open door has already been established. But see, we have a rule at Vet Hunters. We're going to leave them better than we found them. So we bring supplies. <laughs> we bring socks and all this mm-hmm. stuff, right? Well, when we bring that, they're like, wow. Okay. They start talking to us. And then guess what? We go back again and again and again and again to where they're like, man, you guys are actually, you, you really care. You care about you care about us. You care about the message. Look, we're very effective on creating these ideas that we have. I can run down these ideas that we're currently working on right now. And people ask us, how do you vet hunters know these ideas? How is it that you guys are so smart in the homeless game? Well, because we don't get our experience from books. We get it from the streets. We listen to the homeless when we're out there. We know what their obstacles are, and we help break down those obstacles. Mm-hmm. Um, we, like For example, when we leave here, we'll go out to known areas where we know the homeless will frequent, and we'll pass out information. We get calls from all over the United States now, all over the U.S., Hey, I'm homeless, I'm homeless. And we help them even though they're in uh, Nebraska, North Carolina, Florida. You know, when we were first created, the VA didn't know how to deal with this. They, they, they're like, well, here's a grassroots organization. They got a lot of heart, but let's just kind of stand back and see where they're going with this. And I don't, I don't fault them because there's, you know, they, they got to make sure that they deal with, you know, people that are actually meaning to do stuff for veterans, right? Mm-hmm. Now, fast forward, now they call us all the time. We get emails from the VA. We get calls from them asking us for help to help place veterans. And every time they call us, we are happy that they did because it goes to show that we've caught their attention and that we're good at what we do and that we will do everything that we can to specialize. And in other words, the best compliment that we ever got came to us from U.S. vets. U.S. Vets, great organization. Uh, I look at it like this. If those guys didn't exist, it'd be a lot crazier out there. So uh, U.S. Vets, when they asked us, where do you get your funding? And we said, private donations. And they're like, oh, you guys are so lucky because you guys can tailor to the individual veteran as opposed to getting grants because we don't want grants because they'll tie our hands. We we really special. We love being no red tape because the red tape in my opinion based on experience is what keeps those guys out there if the process is so long they're gonna be discouraged i'm glad you brought that up because i think art had a question concerning that right well earlier we were talking off uh before we did the broadcast here about the fact that the veterans administration does exist you have the vfw you've got the american legion you hear these various people on television talking about the handicapped veterans uh, organizations. There's so many veterans groups. How is it that we even still have homeless veterans? Is it because it is such a difficult process that they feel like, oh yeah, that's for the guys who are in a different situation than me and they can't help me? Is that, is that what their attitude or what, what is it? What well, it? Well, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, I used to be, well, we used to be the type of people that we were complaining sometimes about. Why are there homeless vets? The words homeless veteran should never be together. Then we said, we're going to be a solution. We're going to go out there. We're going to learn it. I think a lot of times people want to help. They just don't know how. So that's where we come in. We show people how. Now, for example, for the VA. The VA needs help. They do. Um, they're getting bombarded. I, I, I know I know that sounds great, but they really do need help. Um, I've all, I, I, There's a couple times that we've gone to veteran organizations, uh, American Legion, for example. Uh, and I'm a member of the American Legion. But I've gone to them and I said, look, guys. There's an American Legion, and I'm just using them as an example, because those guys are huge supporters of the stand down. What I am going to talk about, however, is a solution if we frame it this way. Mm -hmm. So we've gone to the American Legion and we said, you guys are in every state and almost every city. And if you're not in every city, you're in almost every county. You have posts. Imagine... If you opened up one post just for transitional housing, you would impact the way we deal with homelessness. For example, in the 18th district, there's 30 plus posts. We're we're really good friends with the 18th district. They have 30 some posts. How many of those posts do you think are dedicated to homeless veterans in a sense of shelters? 
zero, right? Imagine if one of them opened up. They would be able to really cover San Gabriel Valley. Um, we don't know. We try. We've we've said, and I know a lot of those guys have tried. But then there's the issue of it gets voted down. I, look, that's why we exist. Because we don't have that. We're going to vote it down. Look, if it's a homeless veteran issue, we're going to make it happen. Period. Flat out. If we get a call on Saturday, we're going to answer it. We don't do homelessness 9 to 5, Monday through Friday. It's a 24-7 issue. What we have learned is that a lot of the homeless veterans out there, Vietnam vets and all, a lot of them haven't gone to the VA since the 70s, 80s. Mm -hmm. They've had bad experiences. The VA was different during that period. Now, they have a lot of resources. They have VASH vouchers, which is similar to Section 8 housing. They have all these programs. But they don't know about it. So that's where we come in. We go out to where they live, at their level. We're not better than them. We don't go out in suits and ties. We go out dressed. The, we're, the, you see all these holes right here? These, I'm getting these holes in my pants <laughs> from bed hunting. Seriously. They're, my pants, they're, they're only as good as how many bed hunts we do. But, um, <laughs> you know, we've gone through pairs of shoes. Because we're out there. We're out there with these guys getting dirty. We don't show up with a suit and tie saying, look at them differently. Hey, you know what? We go out there and we say, look, guys. When was the last time you went to the VA? Oh, it's been forever. Why? Oh, I had a bad experience with it. Okay, well, look, we don't work for the VA, but we are smart enough to know that you're going to need the VA, especially if you were injured in combat, you need a service claim, medical, you're going to need the VA. So we can help you streamline. And how do we do that? We call it vet working. That's the word that we use, vet working. Mm -hmm. So we establish relationships with the VA, and we tell the VA, look, guys, we're here to help you. So help us help you. So if we have a homeless vet and we call you, put us through the front of the line. I'm not saying that our vets are better than any other vets, but we've done a lot of the homework already. Mm -hmm. So pretty much when they come to you, they're ready to go. So we're hoping in the future, we're hoping that you will, American legions and all these, will they won't be known as a watering hole. They'll be known as, you know, I, use, I see you make a face. You know what watering hole means? Um, as, no, I don't. What's that? <laughs> so, sometimes, and this is the truth, and, and um, again, I'm even ashamed to say that as a member of the American Legion, but sometimes they're known as places where people go drink, bars. And it's unfortunate because that's not true. I, I see a lot of the American Legionnaires out there doing uh, burials for homeless veterans, a sit-in morgues for up to a year because they're not identified. They go out and they support kids. They su Yeah, that's a whole other topic. But, mm -hmm. but um, there's homeless vets right now sitting in morgues that haven't been claimed. And they have they have um, funerals where there'll be a couple legionnaires and patriot riders and BFWs mm -hmm. members there. And if it wasn't for those guys, those homeless vets would have had a, a burial with nobody. You think they deserve to die that way? Nobody deserves to die alone, really. But... Um, but I'm hoping in the future, us working closely with the veterans organizations, we can inspire them to open up one of the posts or convert it to be a shelter so that they can utilize it. What does a post have in it? Kitchens, right? Room, space. Where we can add a couple of restrooms and showers. And what do we have? Transitional housing. Get them off the streets. Get them squared away. Put them in the VA system and get them housed. Let me ask you one question. How many of the veterans of the Iraq War and of the Afghanistan War and of the uh, first Iraq War that we had back with Kuwait have even gotten involved with the American Legion and the VFW? You obviously did, but it's been my impression that the American Legion was getting to be affected by what we call the uh, gentrification of the society. There's so many old people from World War II and Korea, and they've been shrinking. Yeah. Well, I'm, I, you know, I'm not an official spokesman for the American Legion, but I will tell you that I am a member, and I can tell you what I do see. Um, I, I do see that a lot of the Iraq Afghanistan veterans are coming out, and they are starting their own organizations. Exactly. Uh, IAVA, for example, Iraq Afghanistan veterans, um, mm -hmm. they 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 were established uh, to meet the need of the Iraq Afghanistan vet and the, to advocate at the capital. But when you're advocating for Iraq, you're really advocating for Vietnam vets. Right there. Mm -hmm. But um, 
They're starting their own organizations because they they're sm- it's a smart it's a smarter generation in the sense of computers and Facebook and social networking and they use that to raise the awareness and all that. So that's why they're starting these organizations. They're coming out, they're upset, they know PTSD, <clears throat> they're going out and they want to make a difference and they're doing these marches and I started it only because you, I'm gonna tell you why we started Bear Hunters. Here's why. Cause I got tired. If a veteran needed help, I didn't want to have to wait till next month for us to have a meeting for us to vote if we're gonna help them or not. Mm-hmm. We wanted to move efficiently. If a veteran came to us and he needed $180, and I use that number because that's actually happening to us now, we have a veteran at the VA. And he's $180. Imagine that, $180 to keep him in housing. Now, if we don't pay the $180 and this veteran with this family winds up homeless because they lose their bash voucher, you know how much it's going to cost to get him out of homelessness? So $180 bucks to prevent it, right? Mm-hmm. So we're going to pay the $180 and pay the, the electricity bills and everything needed, right? We make that decision now now. Not tomorrow, not two weeks from now, not when we have a meeting, or not because two guys are arguing about, about politics. We do, that's why we established. Because we wanted to leave all the red tape over there in the corner, and we just wanted to meet the needs of the veteran and their families right there and then. So I love my brothers and sisters from the Legion. I really do. I just think that um, you got to create these projects Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, and I think it's a larger topic we talk about a lot on around the valley service clubs in general, mm-hmm. you know, and how do they they know it themselves? You know, Rotary clubs are starting after hours Rotary clubs or new gen Rotary clubs, mm-hmm. and there's all these ways that these service clubs are trying to appeal to younger, you know. But there's a lot of challenges. Uh, time is one of them. You know, a lot of these clubs meet at the afternoon for two hours, or you know, when people commute, sometimes they they're in service clubs that they don't even live in because that's where they are because they work, but. Uh, we're going to take a break, and we're going to talk to our other guest. Yeah. Uh, he's a, a great musician, educator, scholar, and we'll bring you guys back at the very end, and we'll talk about all, all everything t- together. All right? Rosemead Community Events in October, brought to you by the rosemeadquantus.org website. A variety of October activities directed at kids includes the art activity for kids at the Rosemead Public Library, dealing with paper art for kids from the ages of 5 to 12 from 2 o'clock to 3 o'clock p.m. on October 13th, a toddler story time on October the 24th, and also on Wednesday, October the 17th, stories, music, and art for children from the age of infancy to the age of 5. Teen Writers Workshop will be on October the 16th, which is a Tuesday. It is part of a monthly series running from 6 o'clock p.m. to 7.30 p.m., where teens have the opportunity to bring in their written works to be critiqued and learn what makes great, great writing from professionals. Hey, Dad. Yeah? You remember that ball game we went to a couple years ago? Sure. And how you didn't have enough cash for two hot dogs, so you walked with me on your shoulders until we found an ATM? And then when we got back to our seats, we never saw the hot dog guy again. Well, I don't remember all that. Yeah, that was an awesome game. You never know which moments will be the ones they'll remember forever. So take time to be a dad today. Learn more at 1-877-4DAD-411 or visit fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. And we're back with Around the Valley with Joe Liao, the president and founder, and Melanie Villarreal, the co-founder and executive director of the Better, Better Hunters Project, and also Martin Espino, the musician and scholar, educator, and expert par excellence on Aztec music and other things from south of the border. And Mr. Martin, Martin, we've been talking here off the air about some of the unique instruments that they have that leads to some of the music that you've been playing. Could you give me a little bit of a background of why you say that the Aztecs are just at the end of a long string of development of this kind of music. Yeah, it's interesting because a lot of people will say that they'll comment to me about the instruments that I have all made of natural materials like any other culture around the world. And um, they'll say the first thing that will come out is Aztec or they might say Mayan. And those are just two ethnic groups, you know. And um, historically, if you're looking at the history, you know, those are Aztec instruments and I always tell people, like I was telling you earlier, that there's a long necklace that's 300 miles long, and the Aztecs are at the very end of that 
because they learned, they came along historically and came to power. You know, they're the last great empire that uh, that uh, that was there during before they got interrupted. And um, they, while they were living in that area in Central Valley of Mexico, they were absorbing a lot of other uh, influences from around them. And of course, they brought their own things when in their travels before they got to that area. And um, but let's start with the very first thing. Aztec is not a name that they called themselves. The, the in Central Mexico, um, the Spaniards when they got to uh, the Valley of Mexico uh, back in the 1500s, they couldn't pronounce our language. And I make a distinct uh, difference between Spaniards and Mexicans. Spaniards are not from Mexico, and they're still here to this day. You know, where's Spanish from? Elementary school kids still tell me it's from Mexico. And I even tell them, you can hear the name of the country in the language. Korea, where's it from? Korea. Germany, where's it from? Germany. Spanish. Mexico. It's like listening skills. Listening skills. That's why I teach in schools and... So anyway, the, the, there was a German scholar um, back in the 1800s, Alexander von Humboldt, Humboldt um, went and interviewed people and talked to people. And with, they were called the Mexica, that speak the Nahuatl language. And he said, where are you guys from? Our legends say we came from a place called Aztlan. So he goes back and said, mm, I think I'll call them Aztecs because they're from Aztlan. Uh, and then that got into the books. And that's like in the 1800s. So there's no group of ethnic people in Mexico. Natives that call themselves Aztec. Right. right. I'm glad you brought that up because a lot of people don't know Mexico. The word Mexico itself comes from Mexica, right? That's yeah, it's from the Mexica. The Nahuatl language is actually correctly pronounced as Mexico because the X was pronounced sh. And the Spaniards right. don't have, in Spanish, there's no sound for sh. But let's take a step back, actually. What do you do? Because you do a lot of different things. Yeah, basically, I, I'm a performer. Uh, and then what happened during performing. I was uh, getting, I'm like any other musician, you know, you said I'd play guitar first for a long time and I would be playing all these beautiful sounds and go, wow, these are things from my culture, how cool. And I was starting to collect them and I was playing them and I was so happy to play these weird instruments because I liked all these ocarinas that looked like turtles and frogs and then you play them and you get these low sounds and high sounds and some of them screech and some of them sound like eagles and other ones sound like jaguars growling and, and then going, wow, these things are crazy. Then, as I started, because I've always been a musician, I'm 57, I've been a musician since I was 11, I would start playing back like in the, when I started playing, I was 60, 1968. Um, by 75, I was starting to study instruments of my culture, and I was already playing guitar, I was already in college, uh, doing a classical uh, degree back then. And I have a Bachelor of Music with uh, with uh, with honors in performance and classical music. So um, that was from 73 to 78. But during 75, right in the middle of college, I started studying my culture. And um, by the 80s, I started playing. And that's where the education started happening. I'd be out there playing just to have fun. i go, wow, nobody knows about these things. There was nobody playing this stuff. Nobody. And I was out there playing and people going, that sounds weird. Those instruments are out of tune. Um, aren't your ancestors bloody violent people? And I would sit there going, you know, I didn't really study the history. I was just doing research on the music at that time and a little bit of history. And then when I started studying some history so I could have answers to some of the outrageous stuff I used to hear, um, I would go, wow. And then I started having the answers. Then I started looking through the right authors of books to read about our people and discovered that there's a lot of knowledge that we don't even know as Mexicans, for instance. We don't even know ourselves. We have a lot of misconceptions. Um, and the information to clarify it is in not one book. It's in two sentences in one codice that's, you know, six volumes long. It's in a short article in a scientific paper about how the instruments were. It's in um, a f book about costumes and outfits that somebody did on Costumes of the World, and there's three paragraphs that somebody did an excellent write-up, you know, and you have to find them, you know. So the knowledge is there. you got to find it, you know. But you, you were mentioning this matter of you know, being a bloody people. I think the Aztecs have the reputation, at least, of being ones who were 
sacrificing human beings to various yeah. gods of whatever. Yeah, there's a whole. Is that, is that a mythology, or is that, did that actually happen? Well, I like you. I like that you use the word mythology because in in that inherent in the definition of the word is that it's myth is partially a lie mm -hmm. or something that's not true. That which with is mythology. Well, I, I know enough so, about history of many cultures to know that it, history means his story, which means the <laughs> person who is writing it, his version of it. Yeah, if you go to Japan, you're not going to get the version that we get about Pearl Harbor. Well, I think in the case of Mexico, <laughs> most of the time it's their story. <laughs> about us, <laughs> you know, um, and it's not too like uh, there's always someone that will call or write or listen and say that's not true. And I'm going, you know what? This is what I do. This is what I study. I'm not giving anybody opinion. It's not to be at anybody upset. There's no attacking of somebody else's ancestors. You know, um, in in the in the answer of saying are your ancestors like this? And I'm going, I'll say the answer that will throw it back on. Everybody else, uh, like no one else was that way. You know, other people coming to try to conquer other people. What, uh, can we, uh, excuse me, can we take over your uh, land? Um, you know, um, could you share, you know, like a, tear down your capital and let us build on top of it? Is that all right? Yeah. You know, it's never and you know, done that way. I think another, another aspect, too, is like you were mentioning, answers are all over the place. Yeah. And one of the things about Aztec culture that's kind of tragic is Mexico City is built on top of, you know, on top of the biggest city of Aztec or Mexica culture. So it's like if you wanted to find out about it and you had to displace every single building in Mexico City, it's like Los Angeles or New York. It's not going to happen. And so, mm -hmm. you you know, you have a lot of answers. And in addition, it's such a, it was such a large empire, as from what I understand, it's like the United States, you know, if somebody 500 years from now or even today it says, what's an American? How do Americans act? It's going to be different if you're in North Carolina or New York City or oh, yeah. Seattle. Well, well if, if, if I remember the legend of Cortez, and you can correct me if I'm wrong on this because I'm doing this completely off the top of my head going back three decades to, mm -hmm. you know, study decades ago. Yeah. But I believe Cortez literally burned his ships and told his people, you will win this war and take things over or you will die. And they went in and these people were expecting a white-skinned god and instead of resisting, it, which they could have done with a snap of their fingers, they welcomed him as yeah. some sort and of not emissary. They. Not that it was Moctezuma's. Uh, he had had premonitions about things of this nature happening. Exactly. And his brother, Quitlawak, uh, warned him. He says, I don't think this is right, you know. Yeah. And um, so it wasn't just like yeah. all the people get, oh, come on in, you know. It's like they mm -hmm. didn't do that. Yeah. <laughs> they, 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 did, did they even have horses? So when they saw these men on horses, it was a, they didn't know what they, they were. They thought exactly. they were one and the same animal. Exactly. Yeah, uh, I, I think it's a good point to to be remembered that American Indians, you know, whatever that means to you, uh, horses didn't exist in America until the Spanish came. You know, so that's that's right. another idea of how we're Native right. Americans in, Amer in North America. Right, you well, know. John, you know, what, huh. he's, what he is talking about, I know that when I speak Spanish, yeah. people tell me that I do it with a Castilian accent, and that's because the Spanish teacher that I had in high school did come from that heritage, and I speak Spanish when I speak it with a Castilian accent. It's not right. Mexican, yeah. it's not Peruvian, it's not Argentinian. <laughs> right, right. You can tell immediately you were taught by a Castilian. El, el, el segundo. <laughs> <laughs> but let's take it Let's take it back to the music for a bit. Uh, yes. You, know, you were mentioning uh, different instruments that you play. Do you mind just going through those? You mentioned the stone xylophone. Yeah, uh, we have all kinds of wild outfits. Uh, uh, and, I mean, uh, instruments, I mean. But um, let, me, let me tie up the last idea, though, real yeah. quick. The reason why I was talking to you about how, how uh, when I first started playing and people were saying all these things and asking questions, I didn't have any information. Then I started reading. What wound up happening to me is I'm a performer first, right. and because of all these things that were going on around, I wound up having to be like a historian. And I'm not a historian, but now I know a lot of things. Uh, it really helps to know it. And then one day I found myself in the middle of a class with a friend of mine. She said, Martin, could you come help me out play with this bunch of kids? And I said, yeah. I went, and the kids were running over her like squirrels. And I first thing I did is I said, hey, come over here, come over here to this. Next thing you know, I found I had this ability to teach kids. Mm -hmm. So I play these instruments, I teach, I lecture at UCLA, other places once a year. I was just at Cal State uh, once a year for the last eight, nine, ten years at UCLA, the last four or five years at Cal State Fullerton, uh, Occidental College, Azusa College, um, Oxnard, Col yeah, Oxnard College for a couple of years. 
and they film me and put me on cable TV and it's neat and then doing interactive things where I involve the audience. I'll hand out tons of drums to 50, 60 people and we're all playing and maybe the rest of the audience, the other hundred, are all singing. Do you, do you ever work with the after school program? I work with everybody. You name it, I've done it. I I've actually. It. Except I haven't worked with the vets. Well, I would love to do a program that. and I'll come and play for these guys. That's great. We're going to ask you if uh, you bless us to perform at the yeah. stand up. Yeah. Preschools, everything, vets, homies. You know, That's you great. Know. Yeah, I actually <laughs> met rich people. <laughs> rich people too. <laughs> I met you at Peel Pico State Park. I saw you performing with a lot of kids there for a. Uh, Pio Pico's, uh, you know, the last Mexican governor of California, and you were doing something great with uh, Californian st- instruments. Yeah, it was it was like these sticks kind of cut in half at the top, mm-hmm. so when you shake them, they kind of click. Mm-hmm. And you gave them out to everyone in the audience, and everyone was singing and playing those sticks. It was one of the most impressive things I've seen in a I long time. About forty of those things. Cool. Yeah. Was really so cool. I have to make them. So now I'm an instrument maker. Mm-hmm. So I'm, but it comes back to I'm a performer, and the instruments we play on are basically in a nutshell. Is like any time you take any high culture. Uh, and you can name them yourself, and you know, but we're not going to name them all. But whenever you have a highly developed culture, they usually have you know four instruments: uh, voice and all the different languages in a certain country or a certain state, and then you have wind instruments, anything you blow into. And I don't use the, the orchestral term wind instruments because some people go, some people go, oh, you mean wood wind instruments and reed instruments? I go, no, anything you blow into, mm-hmm. uh, because we didn't have reed instruments. Or, um, or or brass instruments, so to speak. Um, so things you blow into, and I'll get into that in a second. The next one were string instruments, and in all of North, Central, and South America, there was no preoccupation, I'll use that word, that's the best one, no care to develop the hunting bow, as other countries around the world did. Because when you get the hunting bow, you attach it to something hollow, like a gourd or a pot, or the skull, which was done before too, which would resonate. And that later turned into, if you look at the guitar body, it's a hollow thing with a hole to let the sound out to move the molecules in the air, and the strings vibrate over the hole. And you look at the, uh, go back to the very first early instruments, which were, uh, very first early instruments, which were one or two stringed harps, which were bent bows over a big gourd, you know. And so thus, in, in Mexico, all we use right now, the most in, an ancient instrument is the large hunting bow, which ceremonial bows could be eight, nine feet, ten feet long, with a deer string, deer a deer skin string, all wound and struck, and they strike it with the two arrows, and it's sitting over large gourds that could be three feet long, three feet tall. I have them at home, huge gourds, pumpkins, big giant pumpkins, and they resonate. And go, dong, 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 dong. It sounds like a big bass. That's the only string instrument we have. And then, of course, the guitars and the harps and the violins and all that stuff come over with the Spaniards. And then the other instrument we have are the percussions. Mm -hmm. And in there is anything that makes a a noise or a tone that through it it should struck. But then, wait a minute, when you strike the string on the stringed instrument, that's sort of blending into the percussion family. But because it's got a string, it's a string. So we have voice, wind, percussion, and string. And that's basically, you know, because I'll do shows, I'll have, I'll fill three tables full of instruments. And people go, wow, you guys had all kinds of instruments back then. I go, no, we only have four. And everybody's <laughs> going, what? Yeah. There are, in a nutshell, to end that part of it, there are five basic wind instruments. The percussion, there's a wide variety. Stones, xylophones, turtles, turtle shells, and everything's used as recycling. You don't get the turtle and kill it you make the dinner, mm-hmm. you know, and then I get, that's just where my audience, can we get into another thing? Oh, that's weird. No, you're going to go home and say, Mart- uh, that was a nice concert Martin did. After this, let's go home and get a sandwich, okay? A chicken sandwich, okay? Mm-hmm. Nobody goes, oh, that's weird. <laughs> but when I ask my audience, do you guys eat birds? They go, oh my God, I never eat a bird. <laughs> uh, Thanksgiving, yeah. uh, Pollo yeah. Loco, <laughs> you know, yeah. You eat nothing? Fry? I've asked audiences, do you eat anything living, especially, especially uh, schools and schools? Go, no. And I go, you've never had a hamburger? <laughs> a salad. What do you guys eat? Oh. That's great. Well, you know, we're going to have to take a break. Uh, we're going to play some of your songs during the break, and we'll come back, and we'll let Lucia have first crack uh, asking you a question. <laughs> okay.
Welcome back to Around the Valley. It's our fourth and final part. Today is the 9th of October, 2012. We have three great guests with us. Two are from the Vent Hunters Project, um, and one is a musician, scholar, and educator, and his name is Martin Espino, and he's going to uh, play a selection for us. It's a little recording of us playing live. Clay pots with drum skins on them. Wooden log drums. That's a double clay flute. This is another fun, uh, short one too. It's the um, log drums, big old horizontal log drums, about three, four feet long, with two keys on them, and you strike them with uh, sticks. And the little flute you hear is like a shaped like a little dog. It's called an ocarina. And this last one is me with a bunch of kids and third grade, my third graders. There's about 30 of them playing here. And they're going to chant in Nahuatl. Now they're all playing the drums. And I'm playing the flute. was part of a, like a six-week workshop, so I was in one school, do it all over the place, and here they are again. Say, Ome, Ye, Nawi. And there they learn how to count in Nahuatl, the principal language of the ancient Mexica, or mistakenly known as the Aztecs. So they were saying, Se, Ome, Ye, Nawi. One, two, three, four. They were learning how to count. That's great. All right, we're going to get Lucy up on the mic. It's really touching just to hear that you you know you're you're so involved with the kids you know in the community and we've talked about earlier how art and culture and these things like these music programs they provide the kids with an outlet you know to express mm-hmm. themselves creatively creatively and it I've talked before on the show about how it's a way to kind of connect with your culture connect with your roots and I'm listening to this and you know it's it's getting me more interested in you know learning about this type of music you know just connecting with roots like because my parents are from Mexico so it's it's a really interesting thing and um, I was wondering are you having any upcoming workshops or anything like that yeah um, I have all kinds of things workshops tend to be when schools call me Mm-hmm. And I'll do like a two two day re- workshop, or I'll do a six week residency. I do a lot. I don't know for some reason I do a whole bunch of them in Encinitas School District out there. Mm-hmm. So I'm there every year, and um, I'll do school assemblies. And um, matter of fact, I got an email last night about returning to. Um, this is gonna sound strange. A preschool. I do preschool things, Aww. and I have awesome. instruments for the little kids that I've made that are real safe, mm-hmm. and. Um, but um, no, you can go to martinespino.com and then click on calendar. And my name's easy. It's Martin, M-A-R-T-I-N. And my last name is E-S-P-I-N-O, Espino. And I'll tell in Spanish, no es Espinosa porque es otra cosa. <laughs> so don't put down Espinosa. It's uh. martinespino.com. And yeah, and you click on calendar. And you can okay. see everywhere where I'm going to be. And when new things come up, like pretty much get gigs like once or twice a week I get a new gig and it's always posted on the, on the website yeah because I know I was mentioning before I saw you in Whittier and uh, you had a gig coming up or you have one coming up in Pasadena 
and mm, um, yeah. and you do a lot of things in Long Beach. You said you were based in Alhambra for ten years or so. Yeah, for ten years, and I live in Long Beach, and and, uh, and I've, I just last year we were up here doing a whole bunch of libraries: uh, Monrovia Library, Alhambra Library. Um, I can't remember the other ones. There was one on Huntington Huntington Drive. We were doing all those things with kids, and yeah, it's, it's with all ages and stuff like that, you know. And also making the instruments is a real gas too. Nice. Yeah, that's that's amazing. That and it's kind of like you said, they kind of tie into each other. You like playing them, then you want to learn about them, then you want to teach people right, about them. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you one thing right away. If anybody wants to know more, there's a great place. You go to the East Los Angeles Public Library, and then you go inside, and inside is another library mm-hmm. called the, the um, CRC or the Chicano Resource Center. That's what they named it back in the right. '60s or whatever. And you go in there, and there's tons of information about indigenous. Uh, music. They have a lot of books that are out of print, that are really authoritative. You can uh, there's a really good one if anybody wants to read it, called um, you can read the very first chapter called Music in Mexico by Robert Stevenson, and it might be even on an ebook. There's also um, Samuel or Samuel, right? And his last name is Marti, which is like Martin without the N. Mm-hmm. So Sam Samuel Marti. And he did uh, several books. Uh, They're all in Spanish except for one. But there's a book called um, Canto, Musica e Danza. um, Song, Music, and Dance uh, of Before Cortez. He did some some really good stuff. I'll be happy to, if anybody wants to write me, you can write to me at um, martinespinomusic at gmail.com. So M-A-R-T-I-N and... uh, um, Martin Espino, E S P I N O dot com. Um, I'm gonna tell you one funny thing about my name. When they hear the word, when they hear my name Martin, they stick an E on the end of my name, and that's a French woman's spelling. So I can assure you, I'm not a French woman. <laughs> okay. And uh, so don't put Martin with the E. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> I would love spelling. to get your your take on saying it. <laughs> I don't know why I thought of this when you said French woman, but, um, you know, <laughs> Covina, uh, they have an Olmec head, a, like a replica they of an do? Olmec head. Yeah, and they moved it, and they decided it didn't belong in front of the library. No, they went from the police station to a park, but some people had problems with it because it was from, like, a prominent place in the city to a not-so-prominent place in the city. Mm-hmm. So some people were offended by that. But it's an interesting thing. I thought you might have an opinion on it, but I guess you didn't know about it. Oh, yeah, yeah, I got a lot of opinions on things like that. <laughs> I, think, I think things that represent a high culture should be placed in a high place. Yeah. You know, that's like the that's the, that's the germ civilization, the original civ- – I didn't say that right, huh? Germ civilization. <laughs> that's what lives in my yogurt. But um, – <laughs> <and>, uh, <laughs> The the, 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 the the seed of all the the cradle of Mexican uh, culture that we know of right now until the dates get pushed back further are those of the Olmecs, you know, uh, yeah. people of the rubber. Yeah, and if if you've never seen an Olmec head, you know, in person, you should drive to, I'll, I'll put a link up I thought, where that replica is because it would blow your mind, you know. And it also introduces the idea that you were mentioning before, that Mexico is not just Aztec, it's not just Mayan. There's other civilizations and yeah. there's timelines and geographical locations. Especially and, when people go to me, Martin, what tribe are you with? You know, yeah. and in, in a thought that all indigenous people are from tribes. And the, then I like to do things, I like to be silly, you know, in the funny sarcastic, oh, what tribe are you with? <laughs> and they go, well, I don't know. You must be with some kind of tribe, yeah. Because there was the Anglo tribe, there was the Anglo-Saxon tribe, there was a the Visigoth tribe. You know, they could be a uh, maybe you're a tribal member of somewhere in Afghanistan. You know, <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. So they, don't they say that they call themselves tribal leaders and things like no, that? No, I think that's a great way to expand yeah. people's perspective. So there's a lot of funny things. It's like you know, and and tribes tend to be smaller groups of people. Then there are, uh, according to uh, um, North American native thought, which is kind of neat. That I, that I run into, there are nations of people, which are large groups of people. Mm. So one of my favorite things is when they go, Martin, what tribe are you with? And I go, I'm not with a tribe. And then I wait a couple <laughs> seconds, and people are, you can see the steam coming out of their head going, wait a minute, I thought the Indians are, are from a tribe. So I go, no, I'm from the Yaqui Nation and the Tepehuano Nation. We're from Sonora and Durango. Mm-hmm. And um, my mama's side, my pe- her people came from Sonora, the other side mm-hmm. of Arizona. And you can look up the Deer Dancer or do look up videos on YouTube for Deer Dancing. And then the Tepehuanos, or which uh, in Nahuatl sort of meant people of the mountain. Uh, so mm. we're the hillbillies from Durango, <laughs> the state of Durango, which is just above the middle central part of Mexico. Nice. 
You know, I wanted to give the vet hunters a chance to ask you a question. It's always very exciting to hear. Uh, we, we had an opportunity to, to hear your music. And Thank it's you. just uh, very peaceful. Um, definitely uh, a lot of historic. Uh, you, know, you listen to it and you think, wow, there's just... All the, and what's impressive about you is that you make a lot of the instruments yourself. I learned a lot. I know we learned a lot, just uh, your passion and the fact that you're educating others. I didn't know it was Mexico. I didn't know that. Uh, Mexico. Uh, is that what it is? Yeah. Okay, but I, I, didn't, I didn't know that. So, <laughs> so, so, but, yeah, this is, this is good things that, uh, you know, we could take with us and say, well, there's a lot, a lot to this. But um, you mentioned that you hadn't performed for veterans, and we have the upcoming stand-down. I know we just talked about that. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm glad we're here because in the hallway, um, I believe it's uh, your, the owner of the station. Yeah, Clark. Yeah, Clark. Clark uh, Mosley. Shout out to Clark Mosley. Yeah, <laughs> Clark says, um, I hope that you're talking about the updates for the stand now. He says, we're, we're glad to be here. But we're going to have entertainment Friday and Saturday, and we'd love to have you. I mean, we're going to have a stage. Yeah. We're going to have sound. Uh, it's going to be over a 1,000 people in attendance. And just hearing your music is uh, very peaceful. And it's uh, for me, a lot, of, a lot of the veterans that will be there, I found a sense of tranquility and peace listening to the music. So I think that they would find that very welcoming. Um, and I, I know I would. So we also yeah. have some warrior music too. That's well, very, you know. powerful. <laughs> <laughs> very powerful music. Uh, like playing for warriors, man. Yes, sir. But I, also, I, warriors need to hear music that's chilled. Yeah. And they need to relax. Yeah, and we, we'd be honored if you could possibly join us out there. And uh, great. Yeah, I'd, I think it'd be it'd be one. We'd show the diversity. We show that there's different types of music out there. But I think. Um, I know if I enjoyed it, Millie enjoyed it. I know that your okay. gifts will be enjoyed by many. So, and then I also have another question, sir. You, you represent Kiwanis, right? It is correct. And and uh, you know everything that we do, we spoke about earlier that that it takes a village to pull this off, and not one of us, like the Kiwanis, not one of us make one single dollar doing this. We do it because there's a need, and we do it because if we don't do it, who will? So um, we're asking that maybe a Kiwanis could help us out. Um, Right now, we have uh, one of the biggest things that we have that we need support with is food. And and uh, we have All Day Friday covered by a celebrity chef from Two Guys Grilling. He's covering all our food Friday. And we have God Provides Food Bank uh, that's co covering Saturday's meal. But we still need Saturday's breakfast and dinner and Sunday's breakfast and lunch. And we're feeding up to a 1,000 people of attendants and veterans. So anything you can do to help us out, even if you put the word out, even if anybody's listening to this, we are a 501c3. We're doing it for veterans. You can, They get to physically see where it's going to, and uh, we really need help. I mean, we've gotten pretty much everything squared away, uh, but food is our biggest thing right now, and we really want to give these guys a wonderful meal because who knows when was the last time they ate, and who knows what they're eating out there. So... It, we, we'd ask if you could help us out. That'd be great. I mean, um, we'll give you our contact info. So we're, what we've learned, it, what we've gained out of this is advocacy, getting the word out through, through the radio station here, uh, picking up a wonderful act that uh, is going to be great for performing, and then also the possible support of the people. Even if you couldn't do it, just for you to show up so that you guys can learn and, and use this as a, as a tool to be able to figure out what the solutions are to the homeless veteran issue, to see it in action. Um, so either which way, sir, if, uh, we can keep it. We'll send you everything that we have so that you have it and you can present it up to leadership and the channel. So thank you, guys. I think you'll find that, uh, just as you do already, that there will be a different route that I will take on this. We have our Rosemead Kiwanis Network that has done uh, some things in the way of food in the past. This is, this is what, two weeks from now? Uh, yeah, close. Yeah, pretty much. They're November second, third, and fourth. So okay. So, so it's really, it's really. Uh, we're looking for the third and fourth, that Saturday and Sunday, because Friday oh. we're blessed to be covered. Well, off the air, but we'll give you the email address. You can send that to us, and we'll uh, we'll go from there. Well, thank you, sir. Appreciate it. That sounds good. Well, it sounds like we're wrapping up. Uh, did you want to finish up with any closing thoughts? We're really yeah. lucky to have you here. Thank you. Thank you for blessing to be here. Uh, the the whole thing you know all the things i've said earlier about the cultures and stuff like that and you know and the uh misconceptions of of, of uh, names and words what, what what i'm trying to do is just present the beautiful things that are in the culture everybody has a beautiful culture that's one of the things i do when i go somewhere 
I'll let them let everybody know. We hope you like what we did. We hope you like these beautiful sounds. These you saw them as being calming and things like that. And yes, and you also, everybody out there has something beautiful. I always tell people as we say goodbye, look in the mirror. Who are you? Where are you from? Try some of your food. Try some of your language. And then it makes everybody appreciate it, everybody each more. Probably one of the reasons we could do to get rid of war so we don't have to have worrying about veterans. The more peace we have, the better. Yeah. That's all I want to say about that. <laughs> that's, that's great. Art, you have any final thoughts? We're uh, running short on time here, so I'm just going to suggest that everybody listen in next week. We will have some new people to interview, and I've got to uh, get to work to try to help this gentleman here on his food problems. That's great. And don't forget <laughs> to shout out to your website. Art organizes community uh, calendars. RosemeadKiwanis.org. Sounds good. Lucia? Yeah, I just wanted to let everyone know if um, if they're interested in any news about Baldwin Park, um, adult education, you can go ahead and go to the Baldwin Park website. It's www.baldwinpark.com. If you have any, if you want information on the El Monte Rosemead Adult School that's here locally, just go to www.emras.edu, and we're having a resource fair coming up soon, so that'll be good for everyone to go to. Yeah. That's great. And I just wanted to remind people we have the 66 Night Market coming up in Arcadia. We have the uh, Day of the Dead celebration in Almani coming up. There's a pumpkin fair coming up at Cal Poly Pomona, which if you've never gone to, it's like 50,000 pumpkins uh, all grown by Cal Poly Pomona. It's pretty interesting. Um, and I had one point that was actually important. It wasn't had to do with pumpkins. Oh, and the stand down, as far as I know, is going to be on the front page of the Mid Valley News uh, on Wednesday, coming out Wednesday. So that will be great. Yeah, and if they, they want additional info, they could go on vethunters.org www.vethunters.org we have information on there and thank you for putting that up there so thank yeah, you yeah no thank you guys for doing it we're happy to get the thank news you. out and um as always thank you for joining us you guys with so many interesting and important things happening around the san gabriel valley it's nice that we can all come together and donate some time and just talk about those things um thank you to my guests thank you lucia and art for always being such great hosts and uh, we'll see you guys uh, around the valley